When you think of things that make you laugh, do you ever think about the things that you shouldn't be laughing at? Have you ever seen a story in the news about somebody who's made a joke and a lot of people got upset at them and because you're not allowed to make jokes about that, that person is now no longer able to, you know, make any jokes or do anything anywhere. Would it be confronting to you, though, if I suggested that it is kind of important that we're able to laugh about everything? Yeah, even that thing. Oh, I've certainly been confronted by that idea. But I feel a lot better about it after the conversation that I had with Daniel Sloss. He is one of the world's most acclaimed, accomplished uh, and truly visionary stand-up comedians. He's my guest on the show today. I can't wait for you to hear it, to be challenged by it. And perhaps, like me, get your mind changed by it. Because he says some stuff in this conversation that really changed the way I feel about things. If you don't know who Daniel Sloss is, welcome. Your world is about to change for the better. Daniel Sloss is an astonishingly successful stand-up comic from Scotland. Some of his Netflix shows, which are remarkable, have really kind of changed what stand-up is, essentially. X is the absolute breakout. It was uh, recorded in Sydney at the Enmore Theatre. There's some guys upstairs fixing a cupboard. That's the noise of cupboard fixing in my house. So, yeah, that show was recorded at the Enmore Theatre in Sydney and it was the first ever comedy special out of the UK to receive a major theatrical release. Sloss has made an astounding show as well. It's called Jigsaw. We touch on that a little bit in this conversation. But it's in Jigsaw that uh, he talks all about love. And in that show, um, <laughs> Sloss, he actually talks about this. It, sh- it led to a number of breakups after people watched it because he talks about if you're not into your partner in this particular way, you should probably break up. And he put it in such a way that was so profound. He stopped counting when a quarter of a million people had got in touch with him and told him that they'd broken up with their partner. So, yeah, he's helped a lot of people not have a shitty relationship, which is pretty great. Daniel Sloss has recently become a dad. It was a... See, I'm the kind of dad that doesn't fix IKEA wardrobes, so that's why there's some guys upstairs in my house doing that right now. Daniel Sloss has recently become a dad, and it was really lovely to have a conversation with him about fatherhood, to discuss comedy with him, uh, to talk about the nature of hard work and creativity. And look, if you're not a stand-up, if you're never going to be a stand-up, or you're never, ever going to want to walk on stage, what you're about to hear Daniel talk about, what he says about dedication and getting great at whatever it is that you do, It's absolutely worth it. This is one of the best conversations I've ever had on this show. And it's possibly going to contain some of the best guidance I've ever heard about excellence and mastery at whatever it is that you're pursuing. Whether, you know, whatever it is in your life that you're into, you're going to hear some stuff in this that will inspire you to want to get as good as you possibly can at it. It's brilliant. Enjoy this conversation with Sloth. Our country and daylight saving are, are pricks. And yeah. um, I grew up I grew up in Queensland where there is no daylight saving and I'm still trying to get used to it. Um, so I'm sorry about the other day. It's the maddest fucking thing in the world, man. I have no idea yeah. why in this, not to sound so much like a fucking younger person, but... The f- fucking just explain to the cows that it's darker. Daniel, there's two people who don't give a fuck about daylight savings. Farmers and toddlers. Yeah. They couldn't give a fucking shit. Wolf was up the other morning like, Dad, can I watch this? I'm like, Dad, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't give a fuck. How old are your so, kids? Uh, we've got two. One's 19, one's three and a half. They came down for the weekend. They're from Sydney. They came down to hang out and go to the F1 and stuff and Oh man, um, I was gu- I was gutted. Gu- so I, I am a terrible F one fan because I only got into F one two years ago thanks to Drive to, to Survive. Means you're an excellent and passionate F one fan. We got away from Gunter. Yeah, <laughs> I've been watching every race this season, and I just feel like I'm joining in at the most boring time because of Red Bull's dominance and the fact that Max Verstappen is clearly just a fucking robot. But he's a great baddie. This is what I love because he's not like a magnanimous winner. No. Like he's he's such a great baddie. Like it's almost Star Warsian and how much of a baddie he is. He's such a great baddie that when his teammate wins, his own father is just like, and fuck you. 
Yeah. And like there's a shot <laughs> as everyone's losing their mind that his teammate has won and his dad, there's this footage of his dad in the pitch just like, no. Nope. Yeah. Fuck, I did not get up and buy a fucking go-kart at 11 and drive this cunt all over Europe for this. Yeah, Fuck yeah. you. I like the interviews it's- where Max Verstappen is like, driving is how my father told me he loved me. And it's like, oh, man, <laughs> if only he had just told you he loved you. <laughs> like, you know, it, it doesn't have to be one or the other. He, you can drive well, and at the end of the race, your dad's allowed to say, I love you. <laughs> I I spent a fair bit of time in the Netherlands and knowing Dutchies, like Verstappen makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Especially you know, like when in the one of the early seasons of Drive to Survive, he's like, Oh yeah, I've been on that boat. Oh yeah, yeah. He's like nineteen or twenty, oh, yeah, I've been on that boat. Oh yeah, la, la, la. He's just it's just a fact. He doesn't yeah. care how you feel about it. He's just simply stating a fact because that's what everyone – but for us Aussies, he's like, Oh, there's fucking tickets on this cut. <laughs> 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 We're pretty fucking up up in arms, but you, you're you're uh, a father to a very small human being yes, at the moment, aren't you? He is uh, thirteen months going on fourteen. Yeah, which I've man, I've never been a fan of the like the month things make sense up until a year, and then we have a bigger measurement. And I'm joining in the month thing because it's the done thing, but it just doesn't. I'm like. Is there that much difference between a fucking 13-month-old and a fucking 14-month-old? Can I not just say one and a bit? Oh, no, it is. It is. When just, well, like, it starts to slow down. Like the amount of leaps and bounds start to slow down. But, yeah, at th- there's a difference between a 12-month-old and a 13-month-old. Yeah, um, uh, but, yes. Well, yeah. I mean, the big difference for us is so br- I've, I've dragged my son to the other side of the planet because what better way to punish a human being who has no concept of time than with the concept <laughs> of fucking jet lag? Um, so dragged him to Singapore and New Zealand. We've been in Gold Coast for a week, so he's been loving this because he's sort of settled in and said, right. And he's he's literally just gone from crawling to walking in the last two days, and he's forgotten how to crawl. It's and I'm so glad because the whole family's been there to see it, and it's like this big, you know, like step. And you're so proud until he just has like a fucking half a banana in each hand. And it's then just running towards walls and couches. And you're like, oh, this is worse. This is so much worse. Like the yep. pride lasted about 30 fucking seconds before yep. I'm being like, I wonder if there's like any baby hit men out there that <laughs> could pay to break my baby's knees just to delay the space. <laughs> there's those moments where when you were a younger person and you'd go to, I don't know, like here we'd have the Easter show where you go to some sort of public place and, you know, you set like a fun park or whatever and you see a parent with literally a leash on their child. You're like, well, that's fucking cruel. You fucking, they're going to grow up a criminal. Right. Now, thank like, you. This is, got it. This is one of the, me and my partner uh, are made for each other and we see eye to eye on 99% of things. Nobody's fucking perfect. And when it comes to parenting decisions, we've discussed everything. We've been open to everything. And it's been a real pleasure to raise a child with her. She believes in leashes, and I'm like, no, man, he's not a fucking dog. He's not, yeah. a, like, I'm not, I'm not training a kid to heal. She's like, but what if you run somewhere? And I'm like, then we have to chase them. Like, yeah. that's the compromise. Yep. It's not reduce them to something that licks peanut butter off my balls. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's wild. And I'm talking to you. My laptop is on a marble table, which is made entirely of marble. Look at this shit. Look like this yeah. like everywhere. Like I look when when I got here the other day, I'm like, we are essentially going to have to become a Sonic the Hedgehog bubble around him the entire time he is here because you can't baby proof this joint unless we go somewhere else. <laughs> so there's, I I will bet you this. In fact, if we put Max Verstappen and Wolf in front of this beautiful marble table and one of this over i'm looking at a crystal little sculpture here that's probably worth a couple hundred bucks like before you said go it would be flying through the air on its way to smashing verstappen would be like i'm ready and wolf would be looking at you like speed up yeah it's gone point toddler hands are the fastest thing in the world yeah 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 terrifying it's terrifying you do talk uh about and quite openly when you're on stage you talk about your relationship with your own parents Mm-hmm. And and gloriously, you talk about your relationship with your sister and their relationship with with what happened with your sister. Have you had the thing now as a dad where you go, oh fuck yeah? yeah. Have you had that moment? 
Yeah, yeah. Like I remember uh, one of the points I had this. So my because of my sister's death when I was uh, I think I was seven or eight, and she was five. It means the age gap between me and my brothers is ten and twelve years. And I remember uh, we were all at Disney together. I'd taken them all over as a thank you for being so very supportive of my career. And uh, when we were there, my, I must have been twenty one, and my youngest brother was eleven. And my other brother was nine. And I, my 11 year old brother was throwing this huge fucking tantrum, right? This huge tantrum. I'm like, oh my God, that's so pathetic. And then at one point, uh, he turns to my dad and says, I'm never talking to you again. And my dad turns around to me and just goes, like I give a fuck. And, right? and, I, and I just had this crystallizing moment where I was like, oh my God, I remember all the times I said that to my dad. And then I realized the reason I'm laughing at my brother is because he's throwing the exact same fucking tantrum I used to put. And in that moment, realizing how irrational my brother was being and how nice my father was being in the wake of this fucking hurricane, I turned to my dad and I'm like, I'm so sorry. Oh. And like, I'm so, like, I now have this crystallizing moment where I'm, oh, don't be wrong, you were probably wrong 5% of the time, but it's not worth yeah. bringing those up now that I've seen it in this, uh, this example. The th I mean, the thing that's really fucked me up is... You know, when I was writing the show about my sister, the first thing I did before I did any stand-up about her was I phoned my mum and I said, I want to talk about Josie and I want to talk about her death on stage. But obviously, you and me have very different experiences from this whole thing and I don't want to say anything that will upset you or will be hard to listen to. And my mum is just like, here's three of the funniest fucking stories you've ever heard and they all involved your sister's disability. So... It, they all went well. We grew the show into into dark, and then and we've always just been able to joke about it and laugh about it while still being serious and you know as respectful as you need to be. Becoming a dad and like finally having that moment when you just click onto how much you love your son and your child. Like, I mean, you think you love your partner. Right, and then before my son was here, I would say to her every day, "I was like, I love you with all my heart. I've never loved anyone as much as I've loved this." And then this other being comes across and you still love them, but it's dwarfed by this love. And it, you, you, they don't feel better about it because they're experiencing the exact same thing. It's given me a new profound respect for my parents because I cannot imagine how fucking difficult it would be to lose a child. Like when I, when I think about what they went through and, and, and this whole process now, and now that I'm here with my son, I'm just like, I mean, you got to remember like 50% of, parents who lose children, lose a child, end up divorced because the grief is just so horrific that there's no reconciliation. Um, the fact that they stay together throughout it, the fact that they still have a fucking sense of humour about it blows my mind because at the time when I was just joking about my sister, um, you know, I'd known her for five years and it was, you know, during my formative years, for me to make jokes about it 20 something years later wasn't that difficult. It was emotional points and I certainly it was a it was a form of catharsis and that I was very grateful for in the end. But there's just no part of me that thinks like if my son were to die, I would I would ever be able to laugh about it. Like it would I would retire from comedy instantly and just go, it's 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 all over. So now when I see them talking and laughing about it and they still make jokes about it and they're still funny, I'm just like, it's a level of strength I just cannot fucking fathom, man. It is astounding, and it you know before I met G, who the one who's nineteen now, I was ten. She was ten when I showed up. I could watch any fucking video, commercial, movie, you fucking name it, right? And then I met this kid, and she was my girlfriend's kid for about I don't know six weeks, maybe eight weeks. And then one day I woke up and I was like, I would push you out of the way of an oncoming bus if it had meant so I'd be squished and die a horrible minced meat death if yep. it meant you would live. Yep. And now. A fucking insurance ad makes me weep. Oh, I'm, right. Okay. So here's my question for you. Sorry to turn the tables. Give me your top three lamest cries as a dad, whether it's a movie, whether it's an advert, something along those lines. Uh, the end of The Greatest Showman, This Is Me. Great. Went, uh, like a brilliant. Like t at the premiere. I was hosting <laughs> the fucking thing. Hugh Jackman's there. I have to go talk to him afterwards. <laughs> like, fuck. Um, Oh my God, this one happened just the other day. We we're watching this, uh, The Last of Us, and it was the exception. I want to bust it for anyone. There's an exceptional third episode where there's a couple, and uh, there's, it's post apocalyptic, but one of them turns to the other and says, I was never afraid before I met you. 
And G looks across at me and Audrey, and she and I are just blubbering messes, and I'm holding her hand. She's like, you guys are fucking weird. I'm like, oh, do you understand what that is? Oh, no. um, oh, my God. And then there's probably a – oh, in the, the Bluey episode, uh, the Bluey episode space, yeah. the Bluey episode space when she comes out of the slippery slide. Yeah. Nuts. Man, we've, we've, we've got a lot of crossover there. I re-watched the third episode of Last of Us for the third time yeah. the other day. And I'm, just, I'm just sitting at home sobbing, going, yeah. make this a spin-off series. Give oh, me, yeah. give me a I whole want. season just about those guys. Just yeah. I, know the, I know the end, I know the start. Give me fucking everything in between. Yeah. Uh, six seasons, I'll, ne- I'll never complain. Uh, yeah, yeah. The bluey episode that gets uh, the last one that I cried to was uh, the whale episode where they're oh both, my god they're both too hungover to play with their kids and the yep. kids are big annoying and then the mum has this crystallizing moment of you know this won't last forever and she does that and i'm like because yeah. man i've had those moments with my son when it's you know i've been asleep for four hours and you're like i don't want to do anything and then just his big stupid smile comes up and you're like what, what what do you want? What is it? The moon? How yeah. many fucking moons? I'll go to a different planet and we'll get you a different <laughs> fucking moon. Yeah. Um, Moana regularly makes me fucking sob. The, yeah. w- the way I punish myself on tour, like whenever I've been away for a while. Because I think it's very healthy. I call it bleeding the radiator, which mm. is like to just cry by yourself during difficult times. It, and if you can't find something to cry at, like somebody's being mean to you or somebody dies, I always go onto YouTube, and it used to be soldiers coming home to their kids. That would always oh fucking God. get me. Um, the new one that I'm so fucking into is uh, kids asking their stepdads to adopt them. Oh, my God. I, yeah. Look, I'm not going to lie, mate. As a stepdad, I have watched one or two of them. And oh, like- oh, man. There's there's one, and I know it's it, – it, it, I was raised in a house where it was okay to cry, and my dad yeah. never made me feel ashamed of it. I don't know where I got it from, but for the first 20 years of my life, I really did try. I saw it as weakness. I saw it as something I didn't want yeah. to. And then I think it's because deep down, I knew how emotional I was. And I was like, we got to fucking, if we can't cap this, right, we got to fucking limit how much it comes out. Yeah. And then, yeah. uh, so for me, the, whenever I see manly men crying, like, really big blokes crying it reduces me to fucking nothing there's this big yeah. guy he must be six foot two he's got tattoos up to his necks he's killed two men i can't prove yeah. this but he's definitely yeah. killed two men and his 15 year old stepdaughter hands him this thing where she just yeah i've seen that he, one yeah. oh my, man he but like it's 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 guttural crying it's mm. so like she has to console him so good so yeah, good yeah. straight into my fucking face in, in your previous work, and I know we keep going on about it, but it's, just, it's an interesting thing to come back to because it makes you, you know, we have this opportunity as dads. We get this opportunity uh, because kids don't do what we tell them. They just do what we show them. And mm. then we have to go, oh, fuck. Fuck. I'm, if I want that person to stop doing that thing, I'm going to have to stop doing that thing because I'm annoyed at it because it, I don't like that part about myself. And it is our opportunity to, to, to stop a pattern of behavior that may have been unwittingly passed down through, through generations, right? You've, you've talked in the past about, about love. You, you have quite famously at, at Jigsaw, you spoke a lot about love. Yeah. And the loving were 100% of, of someone. The, the kids stuff, because you really have no choice. Mm-hmm. You've got no choice to love that person that big, do you? No, and it's it's... For me, the thing I found, I mean, I've wanted to be a dad for a, a very long time, as long as I can remember. Uh, any amateur therapist out there will be able to explain to you it's because my sister died when I was young and I didn't deal with that in a proper way. And I just then outsourced all the love I was missing into younger people. Um, and I, I have a very good relationship with my younger cousins who were born after my sister died. Whenever my friends had kids, I was all over them. But even then, even though I was so desperate to be a dad, when my fiance told me she was pregnant, you, I, I don't know if this is true for everyone, but I found myself being really brutal with myself. And it's not just like, am I ready for this? Is the right time? But like, I'm about to pass this on, right? To somebody I love unconditionally. Is that a fair thing to fucking do? Because 
man, there's no part of my fiance that I don't want my son to have, right? That I wouldn't be with her if I didn't see her as, as perfect and love every part of her. But, and she loves every part of me, even the parts I fucking hate, but I still hate the parts of me that I hate that she fucking forgives. And there's bits where I'm just like, he's such a happy boy, right? And that's his mum, right? That's, that's her. I wake up in the morning and I challenge the world to give me a fucking reason to smile. Whereas uh-huh. she wakes up being like, oh, another day, another smile. Like, I want to follow in her, well, not necessarily follow in her footsteps. Like, it's that thing of like, they're like little Roombas. I, you just want to sort of push them out there and then just see which direction they go in. And yeah. the one thing I've heard, which was the, the greatest bit of advice or explanation I had from any other parents, and not from all parents, because I think some parents don't realise it, but the best parents I know are like, just be aware that your kid comes out the way they're going to come out. The yeah. amount of impact you can have on them is so fucking minimal, right? In, 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 sorry, personality-wise, of course you can raise them in a horrible environment where it's toxic and awful. If you sh- give them love and safety and whatever, uh, they're still going to be who they are. And you can fight against that and you can try and push them in the directions of your life that you feel that you failed at. And then hopefully this younger version of you will erase the memory of your failures. Or you can just sit back and go, okay, let's see what you are. And that's what I find so exciting. Like it's like being a, it's like being a reverse archeologist. Instead of dusting (laughs) off something that's millions of years old, you're just slowly discovering this little person that you made. Like I'm, I'm, oh, okay, here's a question for you. What, what was the, f- Wolf was your son's name, sorry, Wolfie. Wolfgang, yeah. Wolfie. Wolfgang, Wolfgang. Um, what was the first part of his personality that you saw through and you were cognizant or you were like, okay, that's, that's not just baby, that's him? Um, I'm, I think it was a lot like his sister when he, he laughed at a fart. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> he was very little because his sister did the same thing uh, when she was quite young, I'm told. But he laughed at a fart really early. like <laughs> His own fart know. or someone else's? Yeah, his fart. Go well, change it. <laughs> he had a fart and he laughed. I'm like, farts are funny. Yeah, and we, so. come out, we, like, we come out of the womb, fire, loud noises, snakes or spiders sometimes, yeah. and farts are funny. Farts. Like, and... He was him just like putting it together going, <laughs> and I watched him giggle this, you know, eight or 10 week old giggle. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. There it is, man. <laughs> and, and, you, and, you and, just, and you just feel your heart doing that thing oh. that the Grinches does where you're like, it can't get any bigger. You're going yeah. to break my ribs at this point. It is. And, and the, the thing is, and I know this with G, is that every, uh, so we talked about earlier, like 13 months are different to 16 months are different to whatever. Like every couple of weeks you get, you know, there's a new milestone when they're really little, but that doesn't stop. You know, with G, even though she's now 19, she's still a new person about every eight weeks. She all, does this, she's a new new operating system or a new variant mm. about every eight to 10 weeks. And, and it's amazing. It's amazing. It takes a lot of adjustment uh, and it's, it's beautiful. It's mm-hmm. beautiful to see you're constantly surprised and adjusting and amazed by this this thing that keeps happening. And uh, it's it's far more obvious when they're little. Like the, I missed him for four days, I think, and he came back down here. You know when you put your phone down overnight to charge and you pick it up in the morning and go, oh, wow, it does emojis that move. Cool. <laughs> um, he like had a software update. When I was, Three days later, he shows up and like, fuck, dude. You're yeah. talking about constructs of time that don't exist uh, and now you're referring to something. Whoa. It's a m- fucking amazing. And that's the same with G. It just keeps happening, you know? And it's it's astounding, but the job is to is just be there for all of that. You yeah. can't – there's some mates of my life I've known since I was eight and there's other mates I'm, I've been playing a poker game that's been running since 2004. So, I've had the same like 10, 11 guys that I see kind of quite regularly every week, which I'm very grateful for because they're not guys I work with, right? And one of the best pieces of advice when I was first a stepdad, I was grumbling about it. One of them said, listen, mate, yes, she's going to ignore you, but it's your job to be there for her to ignore. Oh, That's really nice. Fuck, you're yeah. fucking right there, buddy. Yeah. 
Got it. Yeah. Thanks, mate. Yeah. And, it, it, and it, up. it also takes you back to the fucking moments when you were a fucking ungrateful little teenager oh, yeah. and your parents were trying to be nice to you and you're just throwing all these. Like, I remember, yeah. like, there's something that happens to you in your teenage years where I don't think it's, I don't think you lose all empathy, but like, whether it's ego that comes into it or whether it is like a diminishment in empathy. I remember there being a point in my life when I would have, I would never argue with my mother. Uh, because my mum was the scary one. And the reason she was scary is because, like all good horror movies, is she would never show you why you should be scared. She would only ever hint at it. Dad would tell you the punishments, right? If you do right. this again, you're going to lose your Xbox. And then you do the mental calculations. You're like, I can go a week without the fucking Xbox. And I know yelling at you is annoying you, so I'm just going to fucking... Mum would very much be like, stop doing that. And I'd be like, why? And she would raise an eyebrow, and you'd be like... But, 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 but my poor father, like I remember this, this of uh, the worst thing I think I've e ever did in my fucking teenage years. When I was 13 and my younger brother was three, we butted heads because I was going through puberty and all the fucking chemical reactions that come with that up in your brain. And he loved his big brother and didn't know how to get my attention. And the best way to get my attention was to annoy me because then it would get a reaction. And it's not the loving reaction. It's the classics. Yeah. It's, it's, fucking, it's the Hotel California of brothers. It's brilliant. Yeah. And my dad just keeps trying to explain this very simple concept to me, mm -hmm. that if I'm just nice to him, he'll be nice in return, and we'll have a better fucking relationship. But I'm not willing to do that because I'm stubborn and a teenager. And my dad, all the time, all the fucking time, trying to explain to me, I was about 14 years old, when in the back of the car, and he, my brother's annoying me. He's just trying to get my attention. And... My dad's t just basically yelling at me to stop yelling at him. Wonder where I learned it from. And, <laughs> and in the car to my father, I say, I wish he was dead. To a man that literally lost his man, my fucking forehead hit the back of his seat as the brakes were slammed on, right? And he just opens the door. He doesn't grab me. He opens the door. He says, take your seatbelt off. I take my seatbelt off. He takes me to the side of the fucking road and he just goes, I love you unconditionally under no circumstance ever say anything like that ever again. You have no idea the power of your words. You have no idea how much. And it was in that moment that it really crystallized for me. I was like, oh, fuck, man. Sometimes when you say things in anger to hurt people, once the anger fucking recedes, the pain of what you've said doesn't. And it was a really important, like, God, God, I sobbed. I sobbed in the car all the whole way. And the second oh I realized my God, God, yeah. I cried all the way home. He fucking let me cry. I go, my yeah. room, I fucking play Xbox. And later on in life, man, when it comes to comedy, like, I do remember that, that, that lesson in stand-up, which is, you know, it's, I believe that we should be, we can say whatever we want. We should be allowed to say whatever the fuck we want. Nothing is off limits. Uh, nothing should never be spoken about. But with that truth comes a huge level of responsibility and a level of empathy that's fucking required that when you're going to do this, to go, right, if there are the chances that my words are going to fucking hurt people, I've got to make sure that I'm not hurting anyone that's been hurt repeatedly before. Let's not fucking punch down words. Let's make sure that if people are offended by it, it's because they misunderstand it and they don't understand fucking comedy. Or finally, if I am upsetting people, it's people I wish were dead anyway. <laughs> <laughs> in our country of Australia, and I'm sure it's the same uh, in in Europe, certainly in the seven America, is that there's cancellation, you know, and no one can ever fucking come back. And this idea that once you've fucked up or you've said something that someone was once offended to, once you go, if the person truly and honestly says, oh, wow, honestly, I'd never thought that that was, a actually, now you put it that way, that's a terrible thing that I said. I'm so deeply sorry. I'm going to work very hard to never do that again. That is never the end of it. Even if they've said that and committed to it and they live the rest of their life with those values in their heart, it will be, you know, I've that's got, I, who they are. I've got I've got two points to this. One is agreeing with you, and one is disagreeing with you. When it comes to people being offended by comedy, the apology will never be enough because when people want you to apologize for stand-up comedy and jokes, what's happening is 
you, as someone they don't know, have upset them and affected their life in a way where they felt powerless because they were in an audience who said something that they couldn't respond back to and made them feel like shit. They should for a couple of days. So when they want you to apologize, you're right. You should just be able to say, I've learned, I've, I've grown, I acknowledge that it was wrong, and I will endeavor to be infinitely better from here on going forward. That should always be accepted as the truth. And if people don't want to forgive that, that's fine. That's understandable. I get that. But that's not enough for people because they want you to feel as powerless as you felt in the moment when you upset them. So it's bend the fucking knee, grovel on your knees. And that's why I don't believe in apologizing for a comedy. I believe in acknowledging going forward. In this idea that you can't come back from comedy, Bill Cosby's not in jail, Louis C.K.'s on tour, Jimmy Carr has been cancelled 79 fucking times, which suggests to me he's never been fucking cancelled in the first place. The, the problem with cancellation, this, this idea of it, especially in comedy, is I believe there are, I believe regular people can be cancelled. I believe you can work in a fucking office job, somebody can find something you tweeted about 15 years ago. We can cause an outroar online and you can lose your job because of that. That goes away when you're a comedian for the following reasons. Less than 10% of any population in the world watches stand-up comedy. In America, where stand-up comedy in its modern form was born, is perfected and is science. Less than 30 million people a year consume or watch live stand-up comedy in any way. So it's therefore reasonable to assume that every country beneath America watches less comedy than that. When a comedian gets cancelled, the joke that is, and by the way, we, we need it to be this, we need it to be that popular, right? It's not music, it's not fucking sports. What we do isn't funny unless we know it would upset everyone else outside. That's the fucking secret. That's the fucking yes. secret. They have to be outside so that we can sit in this room, say these horrible things and be like, but we couldn't say it out there. That's what it is. That's the fucking taboo. And to pretend that this friction hasn't existed forever, which is people saying stuff and society rubbing back, talking about what you can and can't say, we're always going to have these types of arguments. When we do these jokes that offend people, the joke is always clipped up. It's always taken out of context. It's always reduced to the worst bits of what it is. And then the 90% of people who do not understand a lick of fucking comedy have never seen it in their lives. They miss the old school days of the 70s comedians just saying the N word on stage and doing the old fucking Chinese jokes that were all fucking hard. It's those people being like, well, you can't say this, you can't, can't say that. But what I don't agree with this idea of comedians being cancelled is when that happens, I can't imagine how awful it must feel to have the internet yell at you to kill yourself for three weeks at a fucking time. But a bunch of people who were never going to come and see you live are still never going to come and see you live. <laughs> so sure. absolutely nothing has changed there. Zero loss. Net zero fucking loss. But now yeah. a bunch of people who didn't hear of you, who understand comedy, and are forward, they're going to do their own research. They're not just going to listen. And they now know that you say controversial things that piss off the other 90%. And they're like, well, we got to go, I got to go watch this guy. This guy fucking, he, he rubs people the wrong fucking way. Now, yeah. feel free to clip this in for fucking <laughs> when I do get cancelled. And I'm like, it's the mob. It's the mob <laughs> coming to get me. But uh, I just, I, I, because I, I do love the way you put that because I, I think we have something similar. I found a lot of affinity when I heard, you know, you, the way you talk about your parents, the gags they would say about tending your sister's gravesite. <laughs> uh, both my parents were doctors and the only way they could get past, you know, telling another parent of a 10 year old no this is chronic and no there's no coming back from this is to go how's your day honey oh i had a such and such and such today funny looking kid you know <laughs> they had to bleeding the radio man like it's they it's had to say it to each other because otherwise they're just the grimness of it and like even mates like as a buddy of mine he was lamenting. He he became a doctor, but he lamented. They changed the laws in Australia where family was able to access the secret communi well, the confidential communications between doctors about patients. And say, for example, in a juvenile cancer ward, the doctor would write FLK at the top right. Funny looking kid. So the next <laughs> registrar, the next registrar who's probably only in their early 30s or late 20s, who's probably got small children of their own, who's staring at this kid, his six-year-old or seven-year-old child with no hair with a fucking zipper scar on their skull and just is dealing with this horror that we were speaking about before, has a brief moment of going, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And it's, it, it, these are the types of bit that are so hard to explain to other people. And the reason yeah. comedy is only popular to 10% of the population is because it requires a special type of trauma in your life at any point to get into dark comedy. Like something bad has to happen at any stage of your life, no matter what the fucking thing is. Something that during your informative years when your brain is growing and developing, it's slightly stunted by this massive fucking thing that throws you for sex. And it's a coping mechanism. And that's what some people don't understand because for them, a coping mechanism is crying. And there's people out there who they cry, they feel better, they feel sad another two days later, they cry, they feel better. Whereas there's the rest of us that when something sad happens, we cry and we cry and we cry, and then we don't feel any fucking better. And then we just, and then we run out of tears and we just feel fucking empty. And then there's just nothing there. Then. And then I always remember the first, the first laugh after something bad happens to you is always the most powerful laugh in the world because there is nothing more powerful than laughing in the face of something that is beating the shit out of you. Well, for you, it's the, I often, when people ask about what is that I do for a job, I do many different things, but I like to think that I, my job, I only have one job, Daniel, and that's to make people feel less alone. That's it, yeah. you know? And when you're on stage and you say that, they laugh, you feel less alone. You're like, yeah. ah, there's another sick fuck like me here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's nice. It's they always... hear you say it and go, I've thought that, but I've never had the guts to say it out loud. That's nice. Yeah. And, and boom, it... there's a two of you in this huge room have this moment. Yeah. And it's a real bit of the man. It's, I mean, you've nailed it there. The amount of times you walk on stage with a new joke that you know is close to the fucking bone, but it comes from a place of truth in your heart. And you go, oh, this is an awful thing. I thought, I hope I'm not alone in it. And you offer it into the world. Any laughs that come back, you're like, I'm not a psychopath. I'm not a psychopath. Or there are way more psychopaths than we ever thought because <laughs> this is killing. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to think that we're generally really good people and or as, as a general rule, in my community at least of Australia, we're mostly like, as a general rule, we're pretty fucking good people. Just these, these tiny little fringes act on the shit that, you know, most of us kind of just think. When me and I was, I did a tour uh, around India three weeks ago, and my best friend and support ex a guy called Kai Humphreys, they tried to prepare me. They were just like, man, India is, it's very different uh, culturally, morally, um, socially, like just, it's, it's going to be a fucking culture shock. And, and it is, I mean, it's amazing. Food is unbelievable. There's a level of friendliness that doesn't really compete with anywhere else in the rest of the world, but also the friendliness is, feels horrible because it's to white people. Yeah. Like it's, and we're, we're, we're there and we're being stared at and they're not staring in bad ways, but they're just, there's not that many fucking honkies walking around Bengaluru. So they're just fucking staring. And there's so many points when, you know, I'm, I'm feeling awkward because I'm a fucking rich, successful white man who's gone to India. And the last time we did that, we weren't very good about it. And it's sort of seeing after the years of oppression and, and, the, and then demanding that these people catch up with the 21st century. Yes. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's the thing that always, my mum works for the uh, issues environmental consultant. She's a leading expert in the world on mercury emissions and greenhouse gases. So her job at the moment is trying to make India help reduce their carbon emissions. But the problem yeah. is the Western world is like, India is one of the most responsible for global warming in the world. And we need to change that. But we still want them to make everything for us for no fucking money. Can you yeah. guys can you guys cleanly make shoes for three pounds? Is that an option? Why can't you? So yeah. we're out there and all of this stuff is hitting me all at the fucking same time. And it's a lot. And I don't want to go on stage and criticize the country for two reasons. One, India is one of the very few countries in the world where cancel culture and comedy actually exists as in like before you go on stage they're like do not insult the government do not mention that you cannot insult the government do not <laughs> insult any religion do not mention that you cannot insult any religion if you do any of these things there will be police on stage you'll be dragged away and it doesn't matter how white your fucking skin is you're spending two nights in fucking prison right uh, i met no. i met indian comedians who cannot leave their state because if they land in another state 
that's it fucking done for me. Far out. So we're in this fucking situation. And so I'm not wanting to do any of these things on stage because I, I, I don't want to be with my two days of experience, say something flippant and then upset some people. And I also yeah. want to come back to India because it's a fun market. So every awful thought I had, I would just have to pull Kai aside and we would just say horrific shit to each other in the street. <laughs> horrific shit. That if anyone around us was to yeah. hear us say it, they would have every right to beat us within an inch of their lives. Right? <laughs> the whole time they'd be beating me up, I'd be like, yeah, no, fi- yeah, but not the face. I've got a show tonight. The rest is good. The rest is good. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair, mate. It's fucking fair. We've been talking a lot about parenting. We're talking about, you know, the boundaries around around comedy, what's funny, what's not funny. There's something about you that I I would love to share or have get your thoughts on because not everyone's going to be a stand-up comic, not everyone's going to be on stage, but everyone's going to have a chance to help a younger person in their career. You were 16 when you got your mum kept a little eye out for you mm-hmm. and just happened to pass a comedian by the name of Frankie Boyle, told mm-hmm. him about you, and he said, well, get in and come and write. Can you can you speak to the idea of mentorship or the idea of giving a kid a chance? With with the Frankie Boyle thing, originally, you know, my mum had said to him, my son wants to be a comedian, can you answer some questions for him? And Frankie was like, yeah, of course. And she gave my mum his email address. And I must have sent him 30 fucking pages of 150 questions, like being like, I, and, like, and then when you do this in a duel, why do you do this? And what's the best way to deal with a laugh? Do you roll over the laugh or do you let them sit? All of these things. Amazing. For like three days, he doesn't reply. And then he just goes, Jesus Christ, that was long. Just come and visit me. Like, this, it's just going to be easier. And he brought me through to the fringe and he took me to a bunch of his shows and he took me to a bunch of other shows. He introduced me to other comedians. He introduced me to the comedy club where I, I, I did my first ever fucking gig. And I was so immensely grateful for that because in a job where I imagine a lot of people, especially if I do, and I'm one of the most arrogant comedians in the fucking world, I still suffer fucking hell of imposter syndrome. Like at every stage of this fucking job, like there's just, you look around at all these other fucking talented people in this job that you've wanted to do your entire life and then you aren't doing it. And you're just like, at what point are people going to work out that I don't belong here and I'm a fucking charlatan? Because he'd introduced me to so many older comedians who I then ended up fucking gigging with, it really just like paved this way where I had such a good support network. And it's something I've really tried to remember going forward because I wouldn't have the confidence, especially and not even the early career I had unless for him, for, for, for Frankie that is, to try and be like, right, whenever I see new comedians, it's, even if I think they're fucking shit, because so many new comedians are shit. Because, of course, we were all unbelievably dog shit when we started So this. bad. Of course. For years. Yeah. And the thing is, I'll watch a Man, if I watch a comedian who's been going for 10 years and they're shit, no sympathy, no fucking empathy, fuck you, get off stage and stop taking stage time off the younger comics who are actually developing. You've not written a new 20 in five years. Off you fucking fuck. This job ain't for you anymore. Make some space. <laughs> Um, so even when I see comedians, young comedians who fucking eat shit in front of me, the first thing I do is go backstage and I'm like, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. That's the best thing that could have happened to you. That's the best thing that could have happened to you because that's the worst thing that's ever going to happen. And you, and here you are. Look, you went out on stage and you ate, nobody laughed. Buddy, I was in that audience. Nobody laughed. Not even the bar staff. And they love when people die. But they weren't even laughing at your death because your death was so fucking sad and brutal that it made them sad. It was the worst. But, and they're there. I'm like, but it's over. It's over. And here you fucking are. And you've got a gig tomorrow and you are going to do it because that's how we fucking learn and grow. That's an amazing pep talk and that's not – I don't think that's given enough in anything, you know, uh, whether – I don't know whether you want to be a Formula One driver, you want to be a, you know, a, a bicycle rider, whether you want to be a carpenter, whatever. Just get that the first while of you doing it is going to suck and yeah. you sucking is a part of you being awesome. Yeah, man. And, and man, it's so much better to suck at the start because it's so much easier to see improvements. Right? Yeah. At first, like, man, let's say you're a fucking whittler and you're trying to fucking whittle. You got a little bit of log and you're trying to make a cat. 
and then halfway through you chop off the fucking tail and you're like all right well i guess i guess it's a badger then and you fucking whittle it some more <laughs> and then you chop off two of the legs and you're like fuck it, i've just got to whittle off the other two now and now it's a turtle now it's just a fucking turtle it was meant to be a cat so the next time you do that maybe only one leg stays on that, that, that's don't get me wrong it's still not a fucking cat and god you're shit yeah. at carpentry but you can literally <laughs> compare it to the other one and see it grow yeah. when you're really good at something it becomes so much harder to work out where your flaws are where you're failing down and also the second you become good at something ego gets involved and ego makes you blind to your fucking flaws so it's harder to become better later on so if you can teach yourself early on how to notice your flaws and how to improve upon them the best way to do that it will set you up for the success which you will get and that success will ruin you for 2 to 3 years because because by that's there just comes a point in success when you're good at stuff when you're just like your brain kicks in because we're insular we go well I, I'm I'm clearly one of the fucking best at this and yeah and, and there was a time in my career you know fucking 4 years ago where I was like I'm um, one of the fucking best at this. I didn't work on the show. And then surprise, surprise, I didn't like the show at the end of it. It was still good. But I'd spent a year doing a show that I didn't really enjoy performing while also putting zero effort into improving the show and therefore my enjoyment of it. Whereas, the, and, and when I look back at that show, I fucking hate it. But I mean, it doesn't mean anything. I hate all my shows. Um, but looking back at now, when I'm doing this show now, I'm able to be like, Oh my god, that joke got better yes than yesterday, and not because it got a bigger laugh, but because I giggled to myself at one point. Like there's so many times on stage, I find the comedian's brain to be so fascinating that you can do the same joke ninety times in a fucking row. You can listen to it back. You can sit there with your other friends or comedians, and you're like, I think there's a tag here, but I can't seem to find out where the tag is. And they'll give you some, and you'll try something that only work. And then for whatever fucking reason. On the 97th performer of that fucking show, you'll go on stage, you'll have a fucking drink, and your brain will just be like, oh, by the way, there's a massive callback to the start of the show that you've never seen before. And you're like, what the fuck? Like, where, 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 was, this? where was this in the previews, you piece of shit? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting gig that you've, you've chosen. You know, I mean, my, my favorite movie quote used to be, uh, we're going to need a bigger boat. It's now uh, Hyman Roth to Michael Corleone, Godfather Part Two. This is the business we have chosen. Uh, when it's like, this is this fucking gig. You know, I, I, I chose this. But you particularly, and I've got close mates who are stand-ups, here's this thing I will work my fucking balls off to do and create, and then the moment that this time of year, I will tear this up mm -hmm. and I'll start again at zero. Yeah. What does that constant going back to an empty page, going back to facing yourself with, I've got nothing. What does that do for you as an artist? What does it do for you as someone who's going to, in the business of, uh, you know, you're, you're paying your children, you're putting food in the fridge, you know, everything's at stake with an empty page. What does it do for you doing it again and again and again? It makes you infinitely and unfathomably better than your peers. Um, the Edinburgh Festival, which I've been doing since I was uh, 17 years old, I did not want to do my first hour show. I wanted to wait three, year, three years until I had five years of material that I could then, perfect material that I could condense into a one hour show and then put that out. And that's what a lot of comedians do at these comedy festivals. They wait until they've got this thing, this, this amount of material that they can fucking condense. My agent, which I always love her for, Marlena, she was like, you're doing a fucking, you're, you're doing it at the age of 18. You're doing it. And I wrote the show. I think I toured it for like fucking maybe five tour dates afterwards because that's all I could do. And then I was back in the clubs and she was like, you're doing the French next year. And I'm like, but it took me three years to write that one. And she's like, cool, write a second fucking show. And again, I pushed against it because other people who were at the same stage of career as me, they were waiting. They were doing the clubs. They were building the material. They were getting a better set. They weren't becoming better comedians. They, ah, were, yes. they, they were getting a better set. Yeah, yeah. Right? They were perfecting the jokes and not themselves and not their fucking occupation and how they dealt with it. Now, my first four shows at the Fringe probably weren't that good. Do you, do you know anyone who remembers my first four fucking shows? 
I don't remember my first fucking four shows. I couldn't put <laughs> a fucking joke in them. But what I can tell you is I've learned how to write a new show every fucking year, right? And doing those four shows that went to fucking nothing, it built me an audience, it built me people that saw it. And then when I go back, eventually things start improving, I start getting better because I'm able to write a new hour every fucking year. And that's the fucking standard and that's the fucking game. And I'm at the front of the fucking pack here. And then all of my peers, all the ones that were like, we're going to wait. We're going to wait. They waited five, six years to do their first festivals. And I could name them to you and you wouldn't recognize any of their fucking names. This is about a work ethic. Um, yeah. And it's so easy to forget that since this is such a fun job. There's so many times while doing this that it doesn't feel like work. But you've got to remember that that feeling is a privilege. It is a privilege to love what you do. It is so uncommon for people to wholeheartedly love their occupations. So give it fucking everything or lose it and don't complain when you do. It's the, the idea of working, not only making yourself a better comp, making yourself a better, but you're, you're, you're getting better at getting yourself better yes. as well yeah, yeah, and, being, and just c committing to that. If you were to give me five years on the circuit, right, I guarantee you I would have a 30-minute routine that would blow apart any gig anywhere in the fucking world. But that's not what gets people to love your stand-up, right? Yeah. And I, I've only learned this in later years, and it wasn't something I intended to learn. It's just through the, the, the success that I'm so very grateful to have succeeded. Dark and Jigsaw and X are my fucking three specials that for some reason hit some part of the fucking zeitgeist and spoke to people in ways that I never had any intention of it speaking to them. And what I learned through the fucking success of that is, man, I can show you off the top of my head 50 comedians who have better 20 minute routines than all three of those specials. But nobody's talking about their set an hour after it's done because it just fucking made them laugh, right? Yeah. When you give them something else, when there's something to think about, to comprehend, to mull over and swill around the mouth of your mind to, to come to terms with and something that challenges you. Man, imagine, imagine watching a comedian that you love for 50 minutes and then for 10 minutes, they say something that you morally, politically, and fundamentally fucking disagree on. And you're, and you're just there and it's, and it's acting. You're fucking sad. You're going to fucking remember that way more. Yeah. People, people don't come and see me. I don't believe because of any particular single routine that I've done. They come to see me because Every two or three years, they're like, I wonder what his new opinions are. I want to know what his thoughts are. They're not, they're not here for the product, which is my material. They're here for the production. They're here for the, the, the creator. They trust the source and whatever comes out. And that is, man, I wish I'd realized that sooner in my career. I wish somebody had explained that to me um, because it sounds so horrible and capitalistic to say something like you've got to turn yourself into a brand, but brand is just the best way to describe the, the thing that I'm talking about. And that is, if you're, if you're not a sketch artist, if you're not improv, if you're not character, if you're not musical and all this stuff, it's you. That's what you're selling, right? There, we all know how fucking talented the rest of the fucking circuit is, right? The only, and, and there's some amazing fucking gag writers. Some of the best gag writers I know are some of my closest friends. And they'll not get far in life because there's nothing of them on stage. The jokes yeah. are perfect. There's zero fucking fat on those jokes. They are beautiful to listen to. They look like they're so fun to fucking perform. But there's, it's a, it's a fleeting thought in the fucking brain. I've done shows which are, you know, not that fucking brilliant compared to my other shows. But because I, put a little bit of myself in there to give the audience to fucking relate to, to let them, you know, while they're disagreeing with everything I'm saying, there's some part of me that does resonate with them. And that might not be what I'm saying, but it's the passion of which I'm saying something in. The, the logic that I'm using to get there. That's what brings them in. They go, I want to see what Daniel Sloss thinks next, not I want to see his next fucking joke or his next. You're, yeah, and you're absolutely right. They they want to get that feeling. They want to like last time I went and saw this guy, I I felt I'm going to say it again. Like you felt less alone, and I want I want to have that feeling again. 
even yeah. though now I feel less alone about something that I'm quite conflicted by. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm dealing with it. Uh, but I'm, I'm quite mindful of time and I'm also oh. quite mindful that you, sir. I'm have, not on stage for another two hours at the time of your life. But I fucking am, so I'm going to go. <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, like f- foolishly have decided to do a topical news show, which I'm writing every day. Um, well so done. I'm, Giving yourself that deadline. Good boy. Mate, th- when I did my first live show, I booked the venue and put the tickets on sale before I wrote a word. Brilliant. Brilliant. Does the job. Yeah, yeah. The, the, Does the fucking job. The guillotine method. <laughs> Got to do it. And it's the same with this. It's like no matter fucking what, at 7.15 tonight, the vibe tape's going to stop. My intro song's going to play. And I'm going to have to give a show and yeah. that's every day. And it's heaps of work, but it's awesome. I just do what I want to say one, I guess the last thing I'll say, Dan, is like my my deepest, deepest hopes that you can possibly come up with a better explanation of life for your son than your father gave you with the jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But if, yeah. if you don't, I reckon that one's going to work and I'm sure as fuck stealing it to tell Wolfie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're amazing, mate. Thank you so much for sharing your time with me, mate. And no, big thanks so to Marlene well. who helped us re um reschedule this. She's an absolute pro. I really appreciate it. Yeah, she's a fucking Rottweiler, but she's my Rottweiler. <laughs> 